Hey now, everyone, it's Steve Severs for Bionic Buzz. I'm beyond excited to be joined by comic book writer, artist, and creator, Rob Liefeld. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing great. Hey, thanks for having me. Bionic Buzz. I got to do this. Hey, I got to do it. That's cool. We're going to talk a lot in the next 20 or so minutes about your Snake Eyes Deadpool final issue, your upcoming X-Force 30th anniversary tour that's bringing you here to Orlando, Florida. A new X-Force kill shot coming out, Deadpool 30th anniversary covers, and more fun. But before we get into any of that stuff, here at Bionic Buzz, we're all about people's passions. I want to know where your passion for comic books came from. Was it a certain issue that inspired a certain artist or something that was natural for you as a child that make you want to get into the industry? Fantastic question. Yes. So I was um, reading comic books, but they were Archie and Casper the Friendly Ghost and Richie Rich. And those were the comic books that my parents would allow me to read. When I was at the 7-Eleven, I remember issues of Avengers and, and, and Master of Kung Fu. And those looked so great to me. When my parents would say, put those back, you can't have those. Well, my dad took me to his barber and his name was Fred. And Fred had one of those cool little barber shops on Saturdays. Um, every few weeks we would go and Fred had this pile of Marvel comics. And on top of that is Fantastic Four number 147. Prince Namor Submariner is charging out of the, flying out of the water to encounter Thing who's pulled, he's got his hand wound back. He's about to punch Namor. Namor's screaming at him. Oh, and uh, I said, wow, I, want, I can't wait to read this. So while Fred cut my hair, I just devoured this issue of Fantastic Four, which was completely and totally action packed, nonstop. Namor just trashing the FF, trashing the thing. Um, oh my gosh, it's such a great comic book. And 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 Fred saw that like I I think I was just so in you know engulfed in this comic book. I was just it was just taking me to another world. And he said to my dad, he said, Hey, you know if Robbie, because I was called Robbie, <laughs> Robbie wants this comic, be happy to let him have it as long as he gives me a replacement. I just need comic books. So if you want to give me a Richie Rich or and, and I looked at my dad like, please sign off on this, please. And my dad's like, yeah, let's, let's do this. So we drove home. I ran to my closet. I grabbed my, you know, Richie Rich and Caspers. I loaded up and I was able to trade not only for the Fantastic Four, but a, a Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. And at that point, I think my parents were like, wow, these have a really huge effect. Now I'm seven years old. That is, I am seven years old when this occurs. So, uh, um, you know, I just... Uh, from that point on, my parents loosened their reins. And at that point, I, I started really buying up as many comics as I could uh, just down the street from me on the four corners at our intersection. I've talked about this on my own podcast so many times. It's so many magic memories. There was a liquor store that faced a 7-Eleven that faced a grocery store that faced a Pizza Hut. Okay. So the only one of these corners that didn't have comics was the Pizza Hut. And I'm going to tell you, the liquor store had the best selection, the most stacked spinner rack. They hung on to comics forever. Your, your listeners should know, like back in the day, a comic book from like September could hang out till June if it wasn't sold. I mean, these guys weren't really into tearing the covers off and nailing them back. And those, those comic racks were swollen with comic books. And so I just, at that point, I knew these, these were magic to me and, and they really were magic and, and really kind of decided the course of my life i mean that that yeah. fantastic four 147 will always be the one do you still have that have that issue somewhere i or? do oh it's in mylar it is i got i, I got <laughs> that comic and then i have a very nice juicy minty copy as well but um you know i i they are they're just outside in my garage i can access them at any time and my family will tell tell you that there's often i i make I make little uh, little escapes into the garage to pick through all my uh, childhood favorites. So, cause I've got, I'm really the bronze age is my age of comics. That's, you know, and that stuff now is so important across the board. Yeah, oh, absolutely. yeah, I mean, I'm sitting in Black Widow the other night and I'm going Taskmaster is a product of the bronze age. I mean, I remember grabbing that comic off the shelf at this local market and the last page of Avengers 195 introducing Taskmaster and he's holding, you know, Wasp and Yellow Jacket. He's defeated them. He's facing Captain America. And you're like, who's this guy with the skull and the hood and the shield and the sword? Taskmaster. Oh, my gosh. 
and then to see Taskmaster brought to life, you just go, and then knowing that the Eternals is coming out this year, that's, yeah. that's well, in the next six months, I mean, that's from 1976. Shang-Chi came into creation in 1974. Dude, the 70s are having a moment right now with the MCU, so it's a, it's a really exciting time. Uh, real quick, because you were at the uh, Black Widow uh, fan event. Yeah. Near. How, how was a Black Widow real quickly, you know? Uh, look, I'm going to tell you right now, it's fantastic. Um, I don't believe all Mar MCU Marvels are created equally, and, and, and they have to earn their way. Two-thirds of the movie, two-thirds th two of the way through, I'm like, is this the best Marvel movie I've ever seen? I mean, it is. That first two acts is relentless. Um, look, like... Winter Soldier knew exactly what it wanted to be. It was a 70s conspiracy thriller. It was very much... That's still my favorite MCU movie. Yeah, it is. It, that, that's my favorite as well. And it's very much uh, based on Three Days of the Condor and some other 1970s thrillers. Mm -hmm. This movie is very much Marvel doing their twist on Jason Bourne and the Bourne identity. Right. And I am telling you, it, it, you, you will have flashes of the very best Jason Bourne, very best Mission Impossible. It honestly, it may be my favorite Jason Bourne movie without Jason Bourne. It's, it's, <laughs> awesome. I'm like, wow, Marvel, you know, took aim, they shot, they fired, and they they absolutely nailed it. It's fantastic. Cool. Well, let's get into uh, uh, GI Joe now. I mean, congratulations yeah. on Snake Eyes Dead Game. I mean, this is like the, the highest selling GI Joe title. That's pretty amazing, you know, because yeah, there's no, a lot we, of yeah. comics over years. And you got the final issue, the fifth issue comes out on July 7th. Uh, you got some heavy hitters a part of this. Talk about putting together this, this amazing kind of team for this last issue, you know? So so Snake Eyes was uh, a fulfillment of a childhood, uh, you know, dream because before comic books, before that Fantastic Four 147, kids my age, because I'm an old dude, we, uh, G.I. Joe was my first love. This, 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 uh, I knew toys before I knew comics. And so, uh, this was my G.I. Joe, okay? And 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 they, they had all different manner. There was the eagle-eyed G.I. Joe that had a periscope in his eye. And then there was, now don't, I, want, I don't want people crapping on me. This says Kung Fu Grip. That's not my words. Kung Fu Grip, because I don't need any of that appropriation crap. This, it's, it's on the box from the 70s, because he has this special grip. But this was my jam. This was my ride or die. He went everywhere with me. So imagine... You got to understand a, a few weeks before dead game. What am I doing? Putting him back. I'm going to stand him side by side. Hasbro sends me, they've adapted my dead game, red snake eyes. I, I've got a high end collectible. I'm like, <laughs> dude, little Robbie Lightfield needs to know that like dreams do come true. Like, I mean, there it is right there. It's on the box. It says dead game. Like, dude, like I, I have had the most spectacular career. Yeah. Um, but, but to, to send it off in style, we are way too focused on first issues. Yeah. The entire issue, the entire industry is, is hyper focused on premier, premier, premier issues. And then they kind of, you know, forget about the rest of the story. And I wanted this issue five, the culmination of everything that I've been building to, to be really special. And so I really wanted to bring in a legion of heavy hitters. Here's the great thing. I didn't tell IDW what I was doing. Um, I called Neil Adams first, Neil Adams, the greatest, comic book illustrator of all time and space, Superman versus Muhammad Ali. There has never been a comic book that could sniff the ass of that comic. It is the most beautifully illustrated, rendered. Um, his Batman, his Green Lantern, Neil, we don't get John Byrne. We don't get anything. All the guys that influenced me were influenced by Neil. And he was still at his peak when I got you know into comics. And so I've known Neil over the years and, and, and hung out on the convention circuit and picked his brain. And uh, kind of in the middle of his career, he was having some fun inking some of the greats. He inked Jack Kirby, he inked John Buscemi, he inked, um, he inked uh, Gil Kane, Conan's, Tarzan's, you know, whatever. And, and I said to Neil, I loved when you inked other people. He said, of course you did. I'm everybody's best inker ever, straight from Neil's mouth. So I called Neil up. And let's remember, Neil Adams is 80 years old, 80, and he's still kicking ass. And I said, Neil, I've got this Snake Eyes special I'm doing this last issue. My idea is to have all these guys jam on board, you know, jump on and ink me. And I said, have fun with the pencils, do whatever you want. He said, Rob, I won't do just one page. I'll only do it if you give me two pages. And I'm like, are you like, this is already way better. This call is already way better than I imagined. So, so I said, and he said, you give me the best two pages in that book. And so I, I already had the thumbnails. 
and I knew this is what I'm going to give him. So I drew his first, got it to him. I thought I was going to wait a few weeks. Neil sent it to me fully inked two days later. Wow. <laughs> Literally just crushed it, crushed it. I sent it to IDW. I said, take, take a look at this. And my editor emailed me back and he said, am I really looking at a Neil Adams inked Rob Liefeld snake eyes spread? I said, you are. <laughs> and here's the deal. Because Neil said yes. Once Neil said yes, it's like getting Michael Jordan to say yes. Yeah. Like when you're recruiting for the Olympic team. Because Neil Adams is the Michael Jordan of comics. Oh, absolutely. And uh, once I had Neil's yes, I could pick up everybody and say, hey, everybody, would you join me and Neil Adams in doing this? Neil is on board. Neil is on board. Neil is on board. They all said yes. Boom, 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 boom. Everybody came together. The issue turned out spectacular. If you're going to have a giant finale, that everything that we built towards this big conflict, I figured, why not make it special? You know, and so it's got a Larry Hama, the Snake Eyes creator cover. I inked it. Um, I got Larry's permission to use a drawing that he had did in 2019 for a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I, I got permission from Larry. Larry signed off. He said, great. Once I inked it, I, I submitted it to Larry Hama. And I said, D do you still, you know, I know you said for me to do this, but I want you to sign off on this. He's like, Rob, this is great. So it's a great issue. It's got a cover by the Snake Eyes creator, inked by myself. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's 28 pages. It's a, it's a jam-packed, you know, it's a jam-packed job. So I, I think everyone's going to have a really good time. Um, it's, it's, it's a fitting way to, to kind of uh, give this childhood send off to my obsession with GI Joe. Uh, I love it. And uh, yeah, I got to review it and it's some action scenes are pretty epic in this. I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, thank you. I want to check it out. Uh, so you are coming here, uh, Florida at July 9th. Uh, you're doing kind of like a mini tour for the X yes. 30th, uh, here in Orlando, you can do that Coliseum of Comics. You're not right. signing, but then you're doing like a special uh, movie thing. I just moved here. I basically just switched Orange Counties from California to Florida. I love it. I here last year. Uh, one of my favorite things, actually, when I still lived in Orange County, was you, when Deadpool first came out, you did like a I love it. at it. And you did for Deadpool. Tour. I forget the name of the theater, but it was by Knott's Berry Farm. And I yeah, the Buena Park, there. yeah. There, and you you actually talked about you know the creation of Deadpool, the backstory, the backstory in the movie, why it took so long to get made. Is that what people are going to have for this dinner thing? I guess. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, Phil at Coliseum Comic of Comics said, "Rob, would you be willing to do this? I have a special. It's a little kind of exclusive, you know, uh, a limited amount of people and um and an intimate setting." And I said, "Great, I love it. I love look." You understand, I, I love um, talking shop with fellow creators and fans. I mean, yeah. we're all part of the same tribe. And so it's going to be really special. I'm, I, I definitely, um, I, did, I did California for Deadpool's 30th, and I did some Texas shows. And I haven't been to Florida in, um, I think, four years. And so I figured I, I'd come back and, uh, and, and book some of these shows. I mean, book some of these stores. Yeah. I love the store signing. I, I love that it's um, you know, it's it's a more intimate kind of setting. So yeah, we're doing um, be in Orlando and and we're doing this this uh, movie dinner. So it's gonna be a blast. I love, you know, obviously as you can tell, I love to talk. I'm a yeah. talker, so uh, it won't you you won't be um hard up for for words from me. I'll I'll be generous. Yeah, I'll quick, quick remind you of dates. July 9th, you'll be at Emerald City Comics in Clearwater, Florida. July 10th, Coliseum of Comics in Kissimmee, and then in Orlando later that day for the dinner and movie. July 11th, you'll be at Coliseum of Comics, but they're Jacksonville date. And then you'll be at Big Apple Comic Con in New York City, July 6th. That's it. 17th. Thank you, well, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, speaking of X-Force, I, I have to ask, and I, I know you probably told the story many times, but Cable is one of my favorite X-Men yeah. characters. And um, it's pretty cool that he was created so late, but then had a big story. And I guess in 1994 animated series, which I was as a yes. kid, I was so excited to see, a, you know, kind of live action animation version of it. What what was the inspiration? Because I never at the movie thing you're saying how Spider Man and even Bubba Fett was inspiration. Right, right. For what was the inspiration for Cable and you know the metal oh. and the eye and this backstory? So so um, look, I grew up uh, on Six Million Dollar Man. Um, so there's an X-Men number one that launches next week when I'm, I'm at, at all the stores. And I did a variant on that. And a gentleman bought the cover from me last week. And as I handed it to him, I said, I want you to know that when I drew, I just want you to know, because it's, it's the truth and you should know this. And it goes with this cover that I drew this cover watching four episodes of season two, Six Million Dollar Man. 
Um, I have the box set. I rewatch it every year. It's great to, when you're an artist, you can't always look up and pay attention. But uh, Lee Majors, Steve Austin was, I love, I mean, look, Cable, Cable has a bionic arm. He has a bionic eye. They, they match up exactly with Cable. There's a reason for that. In, in this box set of Six Million Dollar Man, there's a great series of documentaries that they did with Richard Anderson, who played Oscar Goldman, and with Lee Majors and the entire cast. And Richard Dean, Richard Anderson, not Richard Dean Anderson, that's a different guy. Richard yeah. Anderson played Oscar Goldman and Steve Austin both talk about the fact that they feel like the Terminator owes them some love because ah. they did the whole bionic thing and this cyborg person before Cameron. And, 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 and they make these really compelling arguments. And, and to a kid my age who grew up watching every episode, I knew exactly you know, where they were headed. And Cable... First and foremost, the biggest hurdle that Marvel had with me in Cable was that I wanted him to be slightly older. And it's funny over the years how they've made him seemingly younger every era because they were like, we don't know if people will like this kind of middle-aged guy. And I said, no, they'll dig it. He's from the future. He has a legacy with the X-Men characters. We're going to keep it secret who he is. We're going to, in X-Force number one, when he first uses his telekinesis, and he starts moving some of the tools around under the ship. That's when Domino says, what are you doing? Do you really want them to know who they are? You know who you are. So we were slowly kind of, but the whole, he's from the future. I love time travel. I want to do a mutant who's seen how everything played out. Because at that point, as an avid X-Men fan, it was really the Xavier dynamic versus the Magneto dynamic. And they allowed me to introduce the cable dynamic. Because I said to my editor, who was surveying all the X-Men, I go, you've got the passive, the, 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 you know, the Charles Xavier, Martin Luther King Jr. approach that Stan said, you know, let's work with them, the humans. And then you have the Malcolm X extremism that they assigned to Magneto. I said, Cable represents the middle. He says, no, you know, Xavier, you're right. We need to work alongside mankind, but they're not 100% trustworthy and there's some bad apples and we need to take care of them. We need to be aggressive in taking care of them because I've come from the future and I see how it turns out. But to Magneto, we don't want to hurt them. They're going to help us at crucial points in our history. So they allowed me to introduce him with all the mystery and unpeel the layer slowly, slowly and slowly. When I introduced Strife in issue 87 alongside Cable, I told no one that when he took his helmet off, he was old Cable. He was another version, a clone, a bad clone. So when my own editor saw that, that I mailed it in because I, I held it tight. The same with Domino. I did not tell them that the real Domino was in the basement of a, of a crime lord. And this was a doppelganger. So, and even on my way out, my editor, Bob Harris said, I got to hand it to you, Rob. I didn't see that Domino twist coming. That was, whoa. He goes, because man, even though I was going off to start image, imagine you're Bob Harris. You're taking over the X-Men office. And you've decided you're going to take a chance on this 20-year-old kid who you just hired away from DC because his work on Hawk and Dove had really bumped, moved the needle. And we had done some big numbers. Um, and you've, you know, and I'm sure there are people who are like, what are you doing putting your faith in this kid? But Bob's like, I want new blood in the X-Men office. And of course, Jim Lee was coming along with me, but Jim had a working, the X-Men was already working. The X-Men was the number one book when Jim took it over. OK, it had been number one for 20 years. It had been number one since 1978. Wolverine, the X-Men, they worked. I took over yeah, a broken, yeah, I took over a broken. Was X-Men, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. X-Men was the go-to franchise. New Mutants was broke. And they said, if it robbed, do whatever you want. Because if it, it, its numbers are so bad. If you can't turn around, we're just going to cancel it. They had offered me X, they had offered me X-Factor, the original five X-Men, but I said, no way am I following Walt Simonson. The guy is a comic book god. He had just done this epic three-year run. That would have been a terrible career management. I knew at 20 years old, you yeah. are going to get eaten alive if you follow him. But the New Mutants, that movie was, that, that book was a train wreck. It was an absolute hot mess. And I knew if they would just let me do my thing and they did. But imagine, you know, the reason the good, I was, I didn't leave Marvel and form Image out of any spite. It was just the next evolutionary step for me. And my editor shook my hand and said, Rob, thank you for all that you brought to this book, all the energy, all the passion. It changed everything. I mean, editors back then got bonuses based on earnings. You don't think my editor cashed some bigger checks 
because Rob Liefeld walked in with Cable and Deadpool and Domino and Shatterstar. I mean, it worked out. I love talking about it <laughs> because it was such a fun time in my life and it was such a big, it changed my life. But Cable, I love super soldiers. I love the bionic man, but I wanted this man of mystery. You want to know who the biggest influence on Cable was? It was Wolverine. I had watched over the course of Wolverine's history, how they slowly revealed different aspects of him. And he made him more interesting and more mysterious and more compelling, more than just a guy who I love to see pop his claws. Mm -hmm. So with Cable, I knew that, you know, I had a couple of years to reveal everything I could before I walked out the door. And so I, I kind of did all the big reveals and then left. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Very cool. Well, uh, speaking of X-Force, you got a new one, X-Force yes. Shot, which is coming out in November. It looks like uh, Major X, is that right? Joining the- He's in it. Yep. Yeah, awesome. That's so cool. Another one of your creations. You know? Yeah, no, um, look, look, I I created this title. I created these characters. It says so in, in some of these comics. I showed Marvel last, like inside X-Force number four, Marvel put X-Force created by Rob Liefeld, okay? Um, um, I'm the daddy. And, and you should want to see more from me. So I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you better than anybody else could possibly imagine giving it to you. And here's the deal. I would have loved to seen Steve Ditko do Spider-Man one last time, 20 years before he died, 10 years before he died. I would have loved to have seen Jack 10 years before he passed away, do the last Fantastic Four story. Okay. I'm definitely kind of approaching this. Like I'll never draw these characters again. Um, I feel like I'm at the prime of my, you know, comic book storytelling, illustration, artistic abilities. I, I this is my passion. I love doing this. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm disappointed that so many in my kind of peer group have fallen off and don't do comics anymore. They, they're not interested, maybe a cover here or there, but I'm like, man, what are you, like, I got a question. Do you even have passion for this stuff? Because comic books is about passion. You don't get into comic books to, to be rich. You get into comic books to tell comic book stories. Mm -hmm. And so, so X-Force Kill Shot is my ultimate love letter to the fans. Um, one sentence, it's exactly what I gave Marvel. I said, it's five different X-Force teams from five different timelines assemble to take down their biggest nemesis strife one, once and for all. Very cool. And they were like, good, do that. I love that. Yeah. Yep. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Very cool. Well, it's, it's also the 30th anniversary of Deadpool. You've been doing a lot of these anniversary covers. Yes. Uh, is there any more coming out later this year? or Dude, dude so, so I believe next week, the X-Men number one Deadpool variant is the 11th of 30. So we have 19 more. Uh, we didn't start doing them till March. So the back end of the schedule has obviously more than we've gotten 11 since March. And then you're going to get 19 more to close out the year. So yeah, no, I've done Deadpool, Captain Marvel, Deadpool, Kazar, Deadpool, the Eternal, stuff you haven't seen, uh, Deadpool, Black Panther, Deadpool, Spider-Man. Uh, all of those covers are coming your way. People seem to love them. They sell out. They, they, they are immediately hoarded by the collectors. So it's, it's, it's been a tremendous, just tremendous fun. Uh, Marvel has been, it's been just a blast doing all this anniversary stuff. Well, it's been a blast talking to you, and uh, hopefully we're we'll running to each other at some convention at some point down the road. I, I guess we're well, hey, in Orlando, I, too, you know? <laughs> I, I hope to see you when I'm out there. Um, yeah. Next year is the 30th anniversary of Image Comics. It's going to be a year-long, giant party. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, talk some more. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man, and we'll keep in touch, all right? Hey, take care. Bionic buzz. No, 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 no. All right, see you, buddy. Hey, man, bye.